Hi, Lisa. Hi. So good to see you. <laughs> so good to see you. I know I already feel so connected for, you know, a couple reasons. Number one, um, we had a really great phone call that almost could have been like a mini podcast, you know, just to for connect. Sure. And then um, I've been able to take in some of your amazing work, your meditations. And so just to have your voice and, you know, and also your Instagram um, profiles, just, yeah, I feel very connected and so excited to dive into your talent, neurosculpting, your backstory. So I, I feel like a, a really important place to start is your backstory because it's really, it's going to set the table for everything that you've created. Yeah. Yeah. The backstory, when I say it, it sounds like I'm speaking about somebody else. It's like, that's not my life, but it, it is. Um, so I was a very calm child, like super non-responsive to stress. You know, at least I thought I was non-responsive <laughs> to stress. You know, I'd be very stoic and I wouldn't startle easily. Um, and then I had a traumatic incident when I was 15, I got hit by lightning and it was at the base of the spine. And like two weeks later, I'm starting to have blackouts and I think I'm fainting. I don't find out for years that those are actually, I'm having seizures. So all of a sudden, a few weeks later, I'm, the world would just disappear. I'd get this weird feeling in my body and I would end up on the floor. And this went on for years and this, these seizures were getting worse and worse and worse. And, you know, friends would witness it. I would tell my parents and, you know, at that time they took me to the doctor and my, um, my official diagnosis when I was like 16 was your hormonal. Wow. That, yeah. That's what wow. I was told. Your, Wait, your hormonal. Did they know that you got struck by lightning? Um, well, here's the interesting thing. My friends and I were out, they all witnessed it. We went back to my friend's house and they run in the house screaming, Lisa got hit by lightning. Parents didn't believe it. And to tell you the truth, I didn't believe it. I, I was like, I know I was flown from yeah. the house. I know I landed in the dirt. I know I was in excruciating pain, but I'm alive, right. I'm conscious. I didn't really get hit by lightning. Come on. It was like that kind of thing in my head. Yeah. Um, that makes so sense. The, so the parents were like, yeah, a bunch of 15 year olds are like, you got hit by lightning. Sure you did. Yeah. Um, but that's, but I started having seizures like shortly right. after that. And I remember my, my friend's parents telling my parents, Lisa had an accident because I was away for the weekend at my friend's house. They took me home. Lisa had an accident. And I come in the house and I'm saying, I'm fine. I'm fine. So I honestly don't know if my parents really grasped that it really happened because I was having trouble grasping. It really happened, but the seizures were there right. and they were getting so bad. I mean, they, it was like, at first it, you'd, you'd pass out and you'd be up in two minutes and you're a little weak, but you're fine. And then by the time I'm 17, 18, I can't get off the floor and now I'm hiding them. I'm, I'm having them either right before I have to go to school when my parents were both already at work or I'm having them when I come home. I often have them during my menstrual cycle, which I would go into the bathroom, you know, and then I'd be on the floor. Um, so it was easy for me to hide them. Mm -hmm. I, my parents did know I was fainting, which is why they took me to the doctor, but they didn't know the extent of it or the frequency. And then by the time I was in my twenties, they were just, they would annihilate me. I mean, I couldn't uh, hold my bowels, my urine, my vomit. Wow. Um, I couldn't move. Um, and, and then eventually I happened to have one in a doctor's exam. Wow. I would, and it was fortuitous. Um, and I said, you know, I, I'm going to pass out. And he said, no problem. Just lay back. <sighs> and I woke up to a needle of atropine like right at my heart, the Pulp Fiction scene, you know, and the needle of atropine is right there. And I open my eyes and this doctor's like white as a ghost. He's sweating and he's, his hand is shaking. He said, your heart stopped. You weren't breathing. You turned blue. You had a grand mal tonic seizure. You didn't tell me you had this condition. Wow. And wow. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. Um, 
I laid on that table for about three hours before they could even roll me because I just could, I couldn't, I was yeah. just exhausted. And I was like, you know, about to vomit. So after a few hours, then eventually they, uh, they had to drive me home from the clinic I imagine, um, and sent me, you know, for all tests, I was an epileptic. And they told me I was, uh, vas I had vasovagal syncope to an extreme degree, which is like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> and that like really launched my journey into neuroscience because these seizures were so bad that I'd be in bed for maybe two whole days recovering. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember saying vasovagal syncope. I don't even know what that is, I mean but I need to go find out. And that was really the, the start of all of it. That's incredible. Okay. So I think, you know, a lot of my listeners and viewers are pretty much dialed into what neuroplasticity is, but for those who aren't, do you mind explaining that? Because that's obviously a big piece to yeah. your method. So neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to learn and automate what it's learned so that it's super efficient and fast. So neuroplasticity is the reason we learn how to walk. And then once we learn how to walk, we never really have to think about it again, unless we get a brain injury or a traumatic incident, right? Mm -hmm. So how fortunate that we've neuroplastically entrained to all the mechanisms of walking. So then in the morning I open my eyes and I just jump right out of bed. Yeah. Well, that was a learned process that was probably the most difficult thing we had to learn mm -hmm. as toddlers. Mm -hmm. It's laborious. Um, so neuroplasticity is your brain's capacity to experience something, make meaning of it, uh, give it a value, mm -hmm. store it in your brain and your nervous system as a remembered event so that I can automate it and that I could eventually refine it and adapt it. So now instead of just walking, now I can dance and I can jump and I can run and I can balance on my toes. And all of those are neuroplastic refinements mm -hmm. of a learned experience. So neuroplasticity means learning. Mm -hmm. And the nervous system will learn and entrain to a response if the response was self-protective and helpful in the moment. Doesn't mean the response was great for you. Mm. right? Mm -hmm. Like our self-protection, everything about our self-protection is high value to the nervous system. So if I'm in a, um, a car and I get into an accident and I flinch like that, you mm -hmm. know, my nervous system is going to remember this happens in the car. Right. And so for the next few days, few weeks, I might get in the car and feel a little nervousness, right? It's neuroplastic memory. Right, right. Of a the, valuable moment. The association. Absolutely. Right. Now, if the behavior is really protective in the moment or helps you navigate good or bad, mm -hmm. you're going to remember that more. Mm -hmm. And then the next time you're in a familiar scenario, your nervous systems go, wait, wait, wait. I have a, I have a script for that. You don't even have to think about it. And it will pull from that really important event yeah. So that it can help you predict and automate behavior in real time. And this is, so this is really, you know, when you're saying this to me, the word that comes to my mind, I'm thinking of is trauma, just more on the kind of negative, you know, this is what happens, right? It's like imprinted in you now. And so you have that traumatic response, um, you know, to whatever the stimulus is that triggers, right? Absolutely. It's all associative uh, memory. So, yeah. oh, I did this during that. That must mean this is important to that. And I'm going to keep doing this every time there's a familiar that, right. you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, and with the nervous system, the more you use a response, the nervous system considers that practice. So mm -hmm. the more you practice it, the better you get. So when you first start, like in my case, I was actually having seizures to stress. Okay. I, that's what vasovagal syncope is. It's a dysregulated nervous system that cannot handle the, the wide threshold we normally have for stress management. So I was uh, crapping out when I got stressed. Right? Yeah. And then because that was self-protective, mm -hmm. helping me not feel the stress, I got better and better at it. So now the seizures are getting 
more and more extreme. My nervous system is practicing, refining and going, oh yeah, this seizure thing, I can do this really well. In fact, I can do this better next time. It's incredible. And, and with that, um, especially with that particular kind of seizure, which is like the freeze response, mm -hmm. the better you get at that, that's the play dead response in, in smaller mammals. Um, so the, the more you engage with it, the better and closer you get to playing dead. <laughs> eventually, according to polyvagal theory, the more you do it, eventually you can play dead so well that your nervous system goes, oh yeah, I'm dead. And you're done. Wow. wow. And that's extreme. But in my case, I was having bradycardia, which is the, the heart rate plummets mm. to an unsustainable level. So in fact, undetectable, um, your reticular activating system in your brain, the part of you that makes you conscious and aware and tracking shuts mm -hmm. off and the breathing stops because the heart is either close to zero or not doing anything. So it is an actual play dead experience. Um, that's intense. So can you, how old were you when you got to this point where you're like, okay, now neuroscience is, you know, your path and your. Yeah. So my doctor's office seizure where I got my diagnosis was probably when I was 32. Okay. I'm going to be, I'm going to be 52. So 20 years ago okay. was this aha moment mm -hmm. of wait, my body doesn't work right. Right. And now, but meanwhile, flashback, I have been meditating since I was 12. So right, like this year is 40 years of meditation. And at that time, I considered myself very spiritual, energetically tapped in, metaphysically trained meditator. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but I have a stress condition. Oh, crap. I don't know how to meditate. I clearly don't know how to meditate. I've been meditating my whole life, yet I have a stress condition. The pieces are not going together for me. And I was like, I'm doing something wrong. Maybe science has the answer. So I kind of walked away from metaphysics at that point. Yeah. And was like, uh, I need to understand what my 10th cranial nerve is doing. And all the connection to spirit and source isn't giving me that information. So I better go get it from a book. Oh, I love this so much because, well, first of all, it's probably a great place to insert that the word stress is, you know, there's good stress, there's not great stress. I mean, you, your hormones shifting is a form of stress. Now, sometimes you're not feeling that obviously sometimes you can PMS. Hello. But my point is, is that there can be stress happening in the good stress stress from your training your workout right but i i think it's important to say that because i think the larger part um of of this concept of stress is when we hear it is like oh it's a really negative thing so it, just to kind of paint a picture in your mind here you are this almost like master meditator right and then you know and meditation is obviously a stress relieving tool right and now you're, you've discovered, I don't have a good response to stress. So yeah, you're like, this isn't working. I mean, I'm just kind of yeah. painting a real, you know, and that's, and then I love then you're like, okay, let's push pause on this thing over here. And then let me move into science, which, you know, I say this a lot to people because I, this is the truth of my life. Um, it is so empowering to learn about the brain learning about the functionality of the brain has literally helped me just, you know, get more emotional discipline, um, just more control ultimately over my well being, right? Because you're not in this, like, it's not all in your head, right? It's like, no, I understand this response is because I'm about to a really hard 10 sand and my brain's job is to keep me safe and it's detecting this fight or flight so it's trying to keep me small and it's you know so i just feel like that's an important kind of setting the table for what's going to come next um you know uh, uh, in your story because i think it's such an important piece for people to understand that when you start to dive into learning about the brain you are empowering yourself you know 
my whole life now not to diss metaphysical studies please to all you metaphysicians out there you know like i have benefited greatly from connecting to spirit right mm -hmm. but i live in a body and the spirit work that i've done didn't give me a manual to my body it gave me a manual to connecting to spirit which is mm -hmm. really important but when my body is starting to uh, be dysfunctional or out of balance, I need to speak the language of the body. And I didn't even know it. I was so dissociated from my body. I had no idea. Uh, my pain tolerance was so ridiculously high that I couldn't feel a lot of things. I could tolerate so much because I had no, I couldn't make meaning of the signals my body was giving me, which is why my body had to give me seizures worse and worse and worse for me to finally say, hey, I think something's wrong here, you know? So I had to study the body and the brain and the nervous system because I live in this and yeah. I don't even have a user manual. Like who would buy an electronic device and choose to never learn how to use it? Who would do that? Nobody. But we have these bodies and we don't even know how to use them. Her Do you know where your stomach and spleen are? I mean, seriously, like my mind was blown. I went to the cadaver exhibit with my daughter when she was like four and there's all these cadavers and they're, they're all, their bodies are open on display. And she points to this thing, which is like way up here in the sternum. And she goes, mommy, what's that? And I said, I don't know. And I look and it's the stomach. And I said, oh, that's the stomach. And she goes, well, then why do we put our hand here when we have a belly ache? And I'm just like, oh my God, out of the mouth is a babes. Well, clearly I thought my stomach was six inches lower than it was too. We don't even know where our organs are. Oh, and we I've, carry them around all day. Like I, I love this so much because when I first learned what mitochondria are, I was literally like, how have I been walking around in this vessel for all the life at the, up to that point and not know what literally keeps me alive. But it's right. so it's that's I love what you just presented because the more that we become aware of our actual vessel, our body, our system and become connected. I mean, you are, this is the ultimate form of empowerment, right? Like, because we know this, I mean, listen, especially now more than ever, is it like on center stage that your health is everything, right? Think 2020 and all of our, it's like health is so important. Well, obviously health is very nuanced, right? You, you just said the perfect thing. Like, if you don't even know where your stomach is, like, let's think about that for a moment, people. Like, no judgment because you know what? I didn't either. I didn't know all these things, right? Like, you didn't either. So, it's like, yeah. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your spleen is? <laughs> no. Oh, my God, I don't. Exactly. We're not really taught. I mean, I guess you can learn in school, but yeah. So, no, please. Um, I love you for saying that. Um, I So, as you start to to, you know, really discover this passion, right, of yours, which would be neuroscience. Mm -hmm. What was that process for you to start to heal yourself and ultimately discover and create your amazing method? Yeah, well, first it was, um, it was really out of desperation because my seizures were getting so bad that the last two I had, I wasn't recalibrating to breathing on my own. So one was, you know, paramedics had to keep me breathing in a food court when I had a seizure in front of my daughter at the time. She was a tiny little toddler. Um, and then the, the last seizure I ever had was I just stopped. I just couldn't breathe. And I was already gone. I was out of my body. I was bartering. I'm like, I'm not going back. I, I, I felt this. I'm not coming back to that terrible little broken body. And my husband was pushing on my chest, you know, and I could, was in and out of like, he would say, you, you, you have to breathe, you have to breathe, you have to breathe. And I thought, okay, this is, this is the last one I can ever have because if he wasn't there, I'd, I'd be done. Mm -hmm. So where did, where did I start? I had to start understanding what was vasovagal syncope? What was my vagus nerve doing mm -hmm. that was short circuiting me? So I started studying 
uh, the work of uh, Peter Levine, uh, somatic processing. I started studying polyvagal theory um, from Stephen Porges, not live, but through books. Um, the uh, neurobiology classes from Robert Sapolsky that were available online, the neurobiology classes at the University of Chicago that were on, I did everything online for zero intention of helping the world, right? It was all self-serving, I have to be honest. And it was, I need to devour this because I'm learning neuroplasticity is possible. I'm learning that I'm engaging in a maladaptive stress pattern. Therefore, science is giving me a little hope that says you can hack into that learned pattern of stress response and you can modify it and you can tone your vagus system so that you have a higher threshold, more adaptability, and then you can start uncoupling from your old learned stress. So science was giving me hope, um, magic really. And so I was just devouring classes. Eventually I was like doing the medical neuroscience course at Duke online. I was auditing classes at the Anschutz Medical Center in the brain lab. I was purely going out there to find out how to hack into my nervous system. And as I was gathering all that information, I was using myself as a guinea pig for my very robust experience with meditation. I was backwards engineering it. It wasn't working. Mm. Why? Oh, it's missing entrainment with this process. It's missing the brain's activity here. It's missing some key elements that the brain needs to really go into the body with safety Mm -hmm. and dialogue with the nervous system and find all the little levers and knobs to upregulate and downregulate and bring myself to homeostasis mm. and then start start softening that learned behavior and and so i was backwards engineering my meditation practice going it's missing steps and pieces it's missing a scaffolding and a regimen and a protocol and um and so i was my guinea pig and then I came up with these sequential steps of meditation that I felt was the synthesis of what I was learning and that I would go into my nervous system in these meditative experiences and I would rehearse a new stress response that was the opposite of C's. Mm. And I was rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. And um, after about eight months of practicing and rehearsing, praying and hoping that this would work. Otherwise I felt like I'd be dead. Mm -hmm. uh, I had another seizure onset and the rehearsal script that I had been rehearsing kicked in and my interrupted my seizure instantly and my body acted out what I had been rehearsing in my script, which was, I'm not going to seize. I'm going to punch, kick, scream. It's going to look ugly and, and and explosive, but I'm gonna keep my body engaged mm. and awake. And that rehearsal script kicked in after, you know, months of familiarizing myself with it. And I never had another seizure again. Like my my seizure halos would come that year mm -hmm. and I would just <laughs> go like that and they were gone. And then I never even had to like body activate after that. The seizure halo would just like dissipate like missed. What's the Caesar halo? I mean, I feel that's like, like the fraction of a second before the seizure where you go <gasps> like, yeah. uh Oh, something's coming, mm. but you don't have enough time to do anything about the brief awareness you get, which is really just a sucky part of the seizure. It's like, if I'm going to go out, please don't give me any warning. <laughs> Cause if you're going to give me warning and I can't do anything with it, that's just mean. <laughs> That's just, just mean. Yeah. Totally. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, that had to have been a really powerful moment for you. I mean, can we just talk about that for a second? Cause it's, it's like a, a scientist who discovered some kind of formula or I don't, you know, like a yeah. remedy. I mean, how, yeah. Yeah. So I didn't, mm. I had faith that what I was tinkering with would work, but the faith was coming from desperation, mm -hmm. not from knowledge or, or real belief. Yeah. I was desperately 
wanting to believe this would work. So I did have kind of like this pit bull kind of faith. But when I broke through my first seizure, even though it was ugly and not graceful, and I was like a screaming banshee, I was <sighs> punching and kicking and screaming. My body was going into full explosive release. Um, and then shortly after the seizure wave sort of passed, I started having neurogenic tremors for hours. Like my body was like, <laughs> like you shiver when you're cold. Yeah. So all of my muscles were having those neurogenic tremors. I didn't know what neurogenic tremors were at the time. Um, so, but I intuitively knew this is important to this process. So uh, is, my is, it like, is it like an aftershock of an earthquake? <laughs> it's like, you know, when you get a chill up the spine and you sort of, yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. It's like that, but it doesn't stop. It's just everywhere. And um, that happened for about five or six hours. And I just had my husband put me in a dark room. I didn't even want to, I was mortified. I didn't want to talk. I, I was so just weirded out mm -hmm. by what my body was doing. And I just went into this room and just laid in bed and shook in the dark and they stopped. Mm -hmm. And the minute those tremors stopped, everything in my body, I can't even explain this. My bones knew the seizures were gone. They wow. knew. And I, I came out of the bedroom and I said to my husband who was at the time my boyfriend, I said, I know today was terrible and it wasn't graceful at all, but I won. Like I won, it's over. And that literally changed everything. I mean, I had, I had bartered in my last seizure, like to whoever I was like, look, if I have to go back to that terrible broken body, I can never have another seizure again. And if you let you, whoever you mm -hmm. is, yeah. let me back into that body and keep me seizure free, I will devote my life to sharing the thing that worked, right? So I was bartering. So when I broke through the seizure, the next day I knew I had to just share this thing. I didn't know what to call it. I knew it was the five-step process and I was, I needed to marry it and give myself over to it. And so that's why I started sharing it with the world. It was because I felt like if I go back on the barter, I'm going to die. Right. Or I'm going to be yeah. like, you can't, you can't renege on your deal. No, not that, especially that deal. <laughs> no, not that deal. <laughs> no. And I'm like, I don't know who I made the deal with, but I'm definitely not <laughs> reneging because I don't want the consequences. So I had to give my life over to it. And that was, that was non-negotiable. And I was in the corporate world. I was, uh, a project manager, an instructional design project manager at a global consulting firm. You know, I was like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm quitting. And my boss is like, you're quitting? What are you gonna do? I'm like, I don't know. I have to share this thing. He's like, do you have another job? No. Do you know how to do this? No. Are you an entrepreneur? No. Wow. But I had to wow. do it. Purpose. It's purpose great. is very, I mean, it's, it's literally part of my brand's tagline, like passion, purpose, and vision. And when you are driven from that deep sense of purpose, I mean, you, you're, you're certainly walking on the edge of uncertainty as a constant. I mean, we always are in life, but you really are. And I know this to be true in my own life as a path creator and an entrepreneur. Um, nobody's telling you how to do it or where to go. I mean, especially something that is so I mean, it, you've, you've created a new neurosculpting and I want to talk about this and it, it, how I've interpreted it. It's, it's somewhat of a blend of, um, where meditation meets hypnosis, something like that, right. In this neuroscience, um, arena, I don't know the better way to, yeah. yeah, it feels a lot like that for people. So my background is I, I have training in autogenic hypnotherapy. I have done tons of shamanic journey as a younger person. Um, and then transcendental meditation and then all the metaphysical stuff. So all of those elements are absolutely in there. And the experience most people say feels a lot like a blend of 
creative visualization journey, mm -hmm. hypnotherapy. But so it's not this clear your mind Zen kind of experience. It's not mm -hmm. that. It's like, let's safely journey deep and you are the author. And what do you want to edit about what you're observing so that your body is healthier in relationship to that thing? Yeah. And so that's what neurosculpting is. And it's very regimented. It's got five steps that the person guides the listener through, or you eventually learn how to guide yourself through it. Do you and mind sharing the five steps? Sure, sure. Um, so the first step is you have to get your stress brain, your stress center downregulated, because if it's not, it's not going to let you change anything because mm -hmm. it's grabbing to the familiar, right? So step one, oh, wait, let me, let me pick up my brain and yeah. describe it. I'll describe it. So, oh, yes. Love so that. if you, um, if you're watching, you can see the brain and if you're not, I'm going to describe it. So the middle of the brain, which is just above the brain stem. And if you were to put your fingers above your ears and drill them in until they touched, mm -hmm. you would be about midbrain. major stress center. It processes stress. So when we're stressed, we have a lot of dominant activity here. We're not going to make changes to patterns and we're not going to safely be able to look at things because we're in self-protection mode. So step one is we have to downregulate the midbrain and we can do that easily with a checklist. Things like, am I dry? Do I know where the bathroom is? Is my body temperature regulated? Is my shirt soft and comfortable? Is my room safe? Am I comfortable? Is this chair supporting me? Am I hydrated? Like base, base survival. If we marinate in that checklist, we will have a little bit of an easing up of our hypervigilant stress response. So it means we're dialing down the volume, right? Of midbrain. Now we wanna dial up the volume of the front of the brain because when that part of the brain is sparked, we're neuroplastically ready mm. to experience something and give it a value and a meaning and then store it, right? So we're priming the brain um, by activating the front to really immerse itself in what's about to come. And the way we prime the brain in step two is we give that a checklist to marinate in. Checklist for the front of the brain is novelty, curiosity, wonder, awe, humor, the most bizarre nonsensical things you can think about will spark some wow in the front of the brain. <laughs> so the checklists are super easy. You can quiet the midbrain and upregulate the front of the brain in the neurosculpting induction, which is like three to four minutes wow. just by marinating in that checklist. Now you're induced. This is very hypno related, okay. right? Mm -hmm. You're induced. That means your nervous system is moving in a direction of wanting to learn mm -hmm. while not self-protective and contracted. That's a great space to be to learn. Right. From there, we dive into step three, which is the meat of the journey. What's the thing, the belief, the feeling, the experience that you want to either create brand new or some old one that's not serving you so well and you're interested and curious enough to go, what's that doing in my body and can I adjust it, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we're just, we're just a collection of our experiences and we can create new ones mm -hmm. and orient to them in step three, mm -hmm. or we can file down the sharp edges of the old ones in step three choices, the use it's user choice. And we do that in a way that um, harnesses bilateral stimulation. So if you were to have activity jump across the midline mm -hmm. of your brain yeah. and engage both hemispheres, your brain's going, hmm, you're using a lot more real estate for this experience. This must be important. It's like, you use more real estate, higher value. So we do that in step three while we're mulling over this really interesting creative journey with very specific words 
-hmm. We spell, we give words, we give number sequencing because the left brain language centers are going ding, ding, ding. Ah, she's spelling. She's asking me to make a list. She's asking me to sequence. And then the facilitator will ask you to think of colors and textures, shapes, vibrations, implications, symbols. And your right brain goes, oh, I'm invited to the party. Cool. <laughs> and so in this really light and fun way, you're actually being facilitated to toggle across the midline, which is, I'm not trained in EMDR, but I've heard from many people, which is a basic premise of EMDR, which is why that's so good at getting into the nervous system. Can you, what's EMDR? I'm not um, I don't even honestly know, know what the letters okay. stand okay. for, but yeah. it's, it's a trauma modality where you okay. are doing bilateral stimulation to uncouple from traumatic memory. Got it. Okay. And so there's something extremely neuroplastically valuable mm. about crossing the midline of the brain. And you, as a, a, a supreme athlete, you know the importance of traversing the midline for counterbalance. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. you know that for every push, there is a pull. For every weight transfer, there has to be a compensation. Mm -hmm you're crossing the midline of the body in order to have grace and power. You have to cross the midline of the brain to have that same kind of grace and power. And so step three after the induction is like, we're gonna go on a fun journey, but all the while I'm actually getting you to toggle across the midline. And then we explore in step four, what's my body doing when I'm either looking at this old belief or story, or when I'm creating this new one, what's my body doing? Because my body's where I live. Mm. And it's, I have to get in touch with this somatic experience. I have to start understanding what it is telling me. Yeah. And so when I discover what the body is doing in response to my thoughts, I link them. I link them in step four with a hand gesture, a somatic cue. So imagine this, imagine I'm guiding you through a thought experience and I'm saying, remember that time where you got the best present you've ever wanted and the smile that came across your face and you're in this memory and you're like, yeah. And I go, and now what if you snapped three times? And then I asked you to think of that memory every day for the next five days and snap three times. What do you think is going to happen on day seven when you snap three times? You're going to think of the memory. You're going to think of the memory. So step four is very much like what people do with post-hypnotic triggers. Mm. At the sound of the bell, you will bark like a dog, you know? Right, right. So, so at the tapping of your finger or at the placement of your hand on your chest, your mind gets to practice the association you made in your meditation. So we're using, it's called Hebb's law of neuroplasticity and it's the basis of like cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm. It's Pavlovian training and we can do this for ourselves for the good. So, and then step five is more of the same. We're giving it a word association. So now you've got all these little doorways in to your experience. It's so neat, honestly. And I know, cause I've sampled some of your work, but and it's just so cool to hear you actually go through the step-by-step. -step. It's so, it's, it's, I mean, I don't know how others feel about it, but I'm like, I just feel like I went on this awesome cerebral adventure. You know, it sounds fun. It doesn't sound like, oh, I got to sit down and do this, you know? <laughs> well, that's the, that's the sneaky thing <laughs> is that um, because it's a facilitated meditation, meaning you can either press play on an audio or you find a facilitator or eventually you get so familiar with the sequencing that you facilitate yourself. Mm -hmm. But because it's so mind active and playful and creative and doesn't have to be in a posture or take itself so seriously, it can be really fun. You don't even realize the structure underneath what's happening. The beautiful thing is the structure is invisible to the user. They're just going on a journey, but the structure is actually directing you to optimizing your effort and the plasticity every step of the way, because who wants to spend 
40 years trying to unwind a memory or a, or a traumatic event when you could amplify your efforts mm -hmm. and condense that time into something much shorter. It's about optimization. Yeah, no, I love it. It's like, um, it's like a right here, right now tool kind of thing, which I think is so valuable. And on my podcast, I mean, I am all about sharing these right here, right now tools to help the listener and the viewer to optimize their, it's, it's really life performance is the focus. And you have obviously different, different modalities to, to do that. So no, I love this. Um, my brain just went in so many different directions right now that I want to, um, I want to adventure uh, with you on, I mean, even you have so many different meditations. There's so many topics, right? Like you, you gave me a couple and they were so great. And it's like a gift that, that keeps on giving, which is amazing. So here's the, here's the crazy thing. I was actually thinking about this the other day. I have for sure, I have facilitated more than 10,000 hours of meditation wow. easily. But the crazy thing is, I mean, I have a private practice. There's not one repeat meditation that goes from client to client. I mean, what, what the facilitation part of it is now you can get a library of meditations that hit different themes that I've created, or you could work one-on-one -on -one with a practitioner and you're like, hey, this is what's coming up for me, or I'm really lacking trust in my life. I want to practice what trust feels like. And that practitioner is going to help create tailored meditations to help you cultivate an association with trust. Or someone comes to me for weight loss and they're like, yes, I don't feel good about myself. It's this, you know, and there's this whole wide spectrum of all the things playing into it. And we get to hit all of them in different journeys. So it's, this I don't, is, it's this, like tailored this, to you, to this, whatever this, you need. This is, this is, this is mindset training. Yes. You know, like, it's like, you're going to the gym and you have a personal trainer and you know, every month your workout, your training is going to look different. And certainly your specific workout is going to look different than, you know, hers over there, his over there, because it's so individualized. So this is like genuine, like this is mindset training. I this is mindset it. training. Okay. So this body, right. So the, the nervous system's job, not only is to regulate us in response to the environmental stimuli coming in, but it's also to regulate us from the messages coming from the body so that we also change our behavior outward, right. Two way street. In addition the whole entire structure is designed to refine itself over and over and over again based on your input. And so everything is your input, what, whether that's your physical disease, maybe you have cancer, what's your input? Well, now there are stories that come from that. I'm diseased. I have cancer, you start to identify with it. So there's a whole series of beliefs that could be softened. Mm -hmm. Then there's the mechanisms of, well, if my cells detect stress markers in my blood, I'm gonna exacerbate cancer production. So we can go to mitigate stress for literal cellular functioning. Like there's no end to the applications, whether it's soft application, like my thoughts, my beliefs, my mindset, mm -hmm. or somatic application, the way my body functions, because all of it is getting its orchestration from the central nervous system. So I, so we have clients that I have a large faction of clients that have physical stuff, mm -hmm. cancer, ALS, Parkinson's, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, um, seizures, uh, EDS, mast cell activation, chronic Lyme, wow. chronic pain. So those people literally can enter the realm of symptom management, mm. depending on how deep they go with the neurosculpting. And then there's the group over here, which is like mindset, optimized performance, concentration, um, moving out of my limiting stories, you know, and they may not have physical issues, right. but they have these emotional things. And those people, it, it's so, how do I say this? It's like 
it's like water. You can add flavoring and make it taste like anything you want. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. No, I could, I see that. I feel that I, um, I, you know, I'm wondering where does the subconscious come into this scenario, this situation? Well, one of the things I like to say in the induction to sometimes is, you know, your conscious mind may try to make sense of all this and that's fine, but I'm not talking to your conscious mind in this meditation. I'm talking to your creative mind. I like to call subconscious mind, creative mind. I use them interchangeably because when I say subconscious, sometimes people get triggered. Like, no, you don't get to go in that, that, that door is closed, <laughs> right? So sometimes I'll say creative mind, but ultimately when your uh, self-protective patterns are easing up, your creative mind has a lot more liberty to inquire and to let free associations come. So neurosculpting is a lot about free associations. And those, I believe, are bubbling up from your subconscious. Certainly they're, they're, they're relics of the way your amygdala is, is associating imagery and emotional content. I believe it's subconscious content. I can't prove that. But um, so instead, I just call it creative mind. I love, well, that's so creative of you. <laughs> I love it. No, I mean, it's a great association. You're right. I can see how people would be triggered. Like, uh-uh, you're not going in my subconscious. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> like that, this private lady, you're not yeah. allowed to go there. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. One thing I really want to talk to you about is affirmations because, um, <laughs> well, so, you know what I, <laughs> oh. uh, you know, I say this, often and it will always be a part of my my you know the content that I share and so for me words are an experience truly and you know I've been writing my whole life so there's there's many angles at which I come at that right I'm a logophile I love words like I have an energetic word for the day that you know I put on myself and and it comes downloaded from my highest self in my meditation but you know, as a writer, I mean, I feel words and they, you sculpt a sentence and it's like, boom. So when you, when I say to myself, I am a leader, I feel that mm -hmm. if I, if I was to say to myself, you really messed that up or you, I don't even know how to like talk shit to myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to see so you try. Sure. You're like, your brain went blank for a minute. That's Am amazing. <laughs> I literally so have funny. to like try and like, you know, yeah. Um, you're a failure, you know, I mean, you can vibe. I feel, I don't know if the right word is vibrationally, but you know, we'll just use it. It's like, I feel that. So when we think about affirmations, um, you know, personally, I'm like, yeah, great. Like have this, I'm very big on the dialogue that you have with yourself. Yeah, Cause I, and I know that it completely influences what you believe to be true about yourself, your in really how you're shaping your lifestyle, your behaviors, right? Um, but you can't bullshit yourself. Like, <laughs> this, is, like this is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Okay. So go. <laughs> okay. So first of all, oh my God, there's so much to say. Okay. So Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor says in her book, My Stroke of Insight, the left brain's job is to name and quantify things so that it can exert a perceived authority over the things it names. And so the left brain's job is to eventually say, I am, right? I am fill in the blank. So your left brain is when you say I am, you are exerting a sense of authority over that thing. You're claiming it, right? But then imagine this, you're, okay, let's go back to the brain for a second. Imagine your left brain frontal language center in the front of the temporal, uh, front of the frontal lobe um, says, hmm, I'm going to pick these words. I'm a leader. And then I'm going to make them come out of my mouth. So your brain thought it, then your motor cortex made it come out your mouth. And then fractions of a second later, your ears hear it. And then your temporal lobe processes it. So you're like, every time you say something, 
you are experiencing the thing you're saying, right? Okay, so that's one thing. So words, I agree with you a thousand percent. So, so powerful. The right words are the ones you need to use for the affirmations. And when I say right, I don't mean empirically proven right words or cultural right words. I mean the right words that resonate with your subconscious. Here's an example. I might open a book. I might go to this great motivational weekend and I'm pumped up. And the speaker tells me, here's what I want you to say. I am the best. And the crowd yells, I am the best, right? And now you're supposed to go home and say this three times every day in the mirror or whatever. I don't know. I'm making this up. Yeah, yeah. Those weren't your words. And you don't know if your subconscious stories can have what you just said. Mm. Let me give you an example. If I have a story that says deep inside, I feel I don't deserve whatever. Yeah. I have a story of self-worth I don't deserve. And then I go to a vision board workshop and I'm told to cut out all the pictures of the things I want. And I cut out this yacht and I put it on my vision board. And every day I'm like, I'm going to have a yacht. I'm going to have a <laughs> yacht. Right. And then underneath that is, I'm going to have a yacht that I don't deserve. <laughs> I'm going to have a yacht that I don't deserve. Right. And then all of a sudden I go on this camping trip and someone's got a canoe and we're in a canoe and it's got a hole in it. And I sink <laughs> and I'm like, wait, I've been trying to manifest a yacht and now I'm sinking in a broken canoe. <laughs> Here's how mantras work. Affirmations. I mean, you already know this, you download it. Yeah. That's when it works. So with neurosculpting, you must dialogue with your nervous system to find the mantra and the words that you have made meaning of already. Mm. You cannot take someone else's words. You can if they accidentally, randomly, serendipitously match your meaning yeah. and then they work. But if they don't, affirmations are not going to work for you. They're going to feel like empty platitudes and you're going to be like writing post-it notes and sticking them everywhere and your life's not going to change. And it's not because affirmations don't work and it's not because words don't work. It's because you picked the wrong words. It's like, you know, I can try to fit myself into my old jeans from when I was 15 every day and it's not going to work. They don't fit. Right. Oh my God. So you have to download the words. You have to assign the meaning. And then it can be one of the most powerful things because if you're all aligned mm -hmm. and your left brain is choosing to make statements about things that are in alignment, and then you're feeling that out your mouth and you're hearing that back in your ears and you're seeing it with your eyes if you write it down, mm -hmm. now you're having an aligned, synchronous yeah. experience of that mantra. And that's when it works like amazing. So, so that's so fascinating. Could, would you say then that, um, let's just say you're reading a book and you know, there's a sentence that just, when you read it, you're like, whoa, you know, you feel it. It's like underline highlight, like it resonates with you in such a, almost like a sensorial kind of way. Like, would you say, even though those, you know, you didn't write the book, is that a form? Yeah. I yeah. feel like, I feel like you're, what you're tuning into is resonance and alignment and that's yeah. when things work. Yeah. So, so here's a great tip. Let's say you, you're like, how do I know if my mantras are working or not? Well, I would do a, I would do a vetting experience with your mantras. Like you, you have a list, go into a nice, comfortable place, close your eyes, breathe a little bit, pick one of those, say it to yourself and then do a body scan. Am I contracting anywhere? Am I tense? Am I numb? Am I antsy? Am I contracting? If you are, it's probably not the great mantra for you because that's what it's doing to you, right? Or if you try the mantra and all of a sudden your stomach loosens and you breathe deeper or you all of a sudden you don't even realize you have a little lift to your cheeks and you're, you got this weird smile or your shoulders drop or you start salivating, that's a good one for you. The body's not going to lie. 
So we consult the body. And I would vet that stuff. You know, I would, of course, go to all these great places and people and learn and then vet how you are receiving it. Because then you can distill the really powerful parts of that and optimize it because they're aligned with you. And so you don't have to waste time on the stuff that doesn't work. So I like to ask the body. That is such a powerful gift that you just gave to everybody, including myself. I love that. And it, it's so, you know, cause again, like words are an experience and I feel them. So when I say certain things to myself, it is, there's like an opening, there's a broadening, there's a, you know, I, or you, I can even get chills. Mm-hmm. Like that's a good sign, you know, like mm-hmm. oh, felt that one, you know? Yeah. Um, I love that so much. That's, that's a very powerful tool. And that kind of segues us into another area that I really want to talk about and have live in this conversation, especially, you know, listen, this is evergreen, but I'm really thinking about where we are in life today, in our world, specifically in our country, especially in America, stress levels. And we're talking about the stress that's like not great for you, right? Um, Anxiety, you know, all of this stuff, like it's just at an all time high, right? And so I would really love if you can talk about like, just is there breath work tools to support those who are, you know, really in a high stress state and dealing with things like high level of anxiety and panic attacks, things of that nature. Yeah, I I would say, okay, so I'm no breath expert, Mm -hmm. but I can tell you that breathing is the basic foundation of how to regulate anything, Mm -hmm. right? Because there's a breathing rhythm and we now know that the eyes have a synchronous rhythm that connects to breath. There's these little uh, saccade movements of the eyes that link to breath. There's a heart rhythm that links to breath, right? Because they're both uh, dialoguing and in partnership through the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. There's so much connected to the breath. So I would say without getting into, you should do this kind of breathing to say that everyone could probably benefit by taking five minutes a day to try to breathe a little deeper, a little slower. And you don't have to get hung up on which nostril and this breathing and the lion's breath and the this breath, because those are all things I don't know about. So, but what I can tell you (laughs) is five minutes of deeper, longer, slower breathing will support the entire system, Mm -hmm. its ability to be resilient. And that's what, that's what, you know, positive stress is our capacity to um, arouse and then come back to regulation. That's mm-hmm. positive. That's, that's usable, manageable stress. Right. Unmanageable is I arouse and I'm stuck and that's my new baseline. And now I got to go further. Breath will help bring that down. And then there are things like enjoyable cardio, right? Getting yourself, which, which ultimately connects to the breath, getting yourself moving super helpful, even if you're never applying any of this to the problem. Mm -hmm. This is you taking agency over the nervous system, which then changes your mind's perception of the value of the problem. Because that's all the place we have agency is just on the inside. And then the induction of neurosculpting, um, which can be done in five minutes, two checklists you should all have in your back pocket in any moment in time. A few different ways to notice your base level comfort in any moment. And then a few bizarre, fun, little uh, awe-inspired statements that you can be like, at any moment in time, life's terrible, life's unmanageable. Oh my God, there's COVID, there's this, there's that. Okay, but I know where the bathroom is. (laughs) I have an empty bladder. I can drink water if I need it. Okay. Dial that down, mid, but dial that midbrain down. And then the next checklist, three bizarre nonsensical things. I wonder what it would be like if everybody right now uh, was naked with a feather boa and a clown nose. <laughs> That's prefrontal activation, number one. Number two, what would it be like if trees were made of numbers? I don't know, maybe a pine tree's 11 or a seven or a three. 
And then maybe a third one. I wonder what it would be like if, I, if every time I spoke, colors came out. Three bizarre Dr. Seuss kind of invitations. So cool. And that those two checklists can literally reframe the way your body orients in the moment, which then changes the way you process the experience. And so those two checklists are in my back pocket all the time. Ugh, I'm going to come up with mine today. I love that so much. Okay. So before I lead us um, out of this incredible conversation that I'm so grateful for, I feel like you and I have many more collaborations. We have a lot more things to talk about. I feel. Yeah. Well, and also like, there's just ways that I want to collaborate with you um, that I, I just, I'm, I'm already looking forward to. Um, but before we go into the, the final kind of segment of our talk, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you would like to live in this conversation? Something that maybe you wish somebody asked you more about? Um, anything like that? I know we covered a lot, so no pressure. We but... did cover a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's... anyone can ask me anything. Uh, you reach me in all different ways. I'm very responsive. Okay, perfect. All right. So... One of the questions I love to ask all my guests um, when they first come on is if you had a magic wand and you could give the masses one positive habit that would have a large ripple effect on their life, a positive ripple effect, what would that be and why? Shaking. Every day. Shaking. Everybody shake 30 seconds vigorously, the whole body <laughs> like that, where you're like shivering, kind of shaking. Um, because it is so tonifying for the entire nervous system. If you're aroused, stressed, it's going to dissipate the contraction in the muscles, soften those muscles, and that's going to send us a, a feedback back to the brain that says, I'm good, I'm soft, I'm chill. And if you're in frozen kind of stress, it's going to wake the body up to feeling and sensation, and then it's going to dissipate the contractions. So shaking is like, my go-to. It's free and you can do it in 30 seconds and you can do it to any level body capacity you have. That's powerful. That made me think of, there's a, I don't know if they still really exist, but at the gym, there was this, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, like the shaking. shaking. Yes. Yes. Yep. <laughs> That's so cool. I'm going to shake after this podcast. Um, okay. So then the last part is I have these words, the rapid fire words. I send them to you rapidly, but you do not have to be rapid or one word about your response. It's just whatever the word makes you feel top of mind, top of heart. Mm. I would love for you to just, um, elaborate, share and elaborate. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. It's, it's like a little game at the end. It's so fun. Uh, okay. Ready for first word. Ready. Love. Mm, that's my husband and my daughter. And that is a whole bunch of trust and a shit ton of comedy. Love is comedy. <laughs> comedy. That's my answer, final answer. I love that. Did I get it right? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so good. It is pretty humorous, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Next word is fear. Uh, my youth. Um a great learning tool, fabulous teacher, and a friend. Okay, I love it. Yeah. Next word is passion. The juice of life. <laughs> the juice of life. Without it, it's not juicy. Yeah, I agree. That's juicy. the best way to put it. That's I like right. juicy. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. This whole conversation is just- I look, I didn't I come it. here to be parched, people. <laughs> like, I want the juicy life. I love it. I'm with you, girl. Oh my gosh, my face and my cheeks. Um, okay, next word is curiosity. Ah, that's the mojo. <laughs> that is the mojo, curiosity. Um yeah, I'm just going to say mojo. Uh, I think that's perfect. That's like incredible, actually. Um, I love it. Uh, okay, next word is challenge. Ah, that's the invitation for application. That's where you get to see who you are and what you're made of. Yeah, that's what yes. I always say. I yeah? love it so much. I can't even help that reaction. That's so great. That's what I always 
Well, sometimes when I'm training and when shit gets really hard, I'll look in the mirror and be like, who are you right now, huh? Mm. Who are you? And when it's like you're tired and you just, you know, in that moment, I want to know who I am. So I confront myself and Ooh. it's all done with love, but it's Ooh, so I just got powerful. Chills. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Nice. That is awesome. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Next word is courage. Ah, that is a shape shifter. Courage is the shape shifter for me because sometimes it could be quiet and slow. And sometimes it could be really, really in your face and loud. So Courage is a shape shifter. And until I recognize it's a shape shifter, sometimes I think I don't have any. But then when I realize it's a shape shifter, I can go find it. So good. Mm. You are an artist. I love it. Ooh. <laughs> okay, two more words. Okay. Next one is one of my favorites resilience. That is, mm, it's like the thing, it, it's the definition of human we we came here to adapt and to change in every single moment otherwise we'd all still be infants in diapers so to me resilience is like the definition of being human i love it mm. yeah final word is excellence that is your personal daily best that can change every single day i agree yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love you. Yeah, this this word game was fun. <laughs> Isn't it fun? I, I've been on a know. lot of podcasts. No one ever <laughs> plays word games with me. Really? Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, you. I mean, you're the perfect person to be <laughs> this game with. It's like you're like boom. There's no wrong answer, but it's so fun. You can imagine with all my guests who are all so yes. unique and different. How you know what their answers are, and then a lot of times there's a lot of similarities in their answers, which is also so cool. Um. Okay, before I let you go, first of all, I want to say thank you for mm -hmm. this amazing conversation. I am so excited to share this with the world and just grateful to be connected with you. Shout out to my girl, my cosmic sister, Gabrielle Lyon. Yes. I love her. She's like the ultimate connector. She just knows, you know? She's a little goddess, that one. Oh, yeah. yeah. She's a fierce goddess for yes. sure. I yes. love her. And um, I also just want to say thank you for being such a contributor because of the work that you do is an absolute contribution. And so I just want to recognize you for that well, right now. Thank you for putting yourself out there in such a very clear, passionate, and authentic way. I love watching your stuff oh, and it you. gets me very inspired. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. So before... I let you go. Can you please let our listeners, our viewers know how to stay connected with you, how to work with a therapist, like all the things. Like I, yes. I want to learn your five stuff to start applying it. Like all of yeah. that. Great. Some, yeah. Couple ways. If you want to dialogue with me, you can email info at neurosculptinginstitute.com and we'll get you answers and dialogue. You can follow Neurosculpting Institute and Neuropraxis on Instagram. They're two different channels. Um, if you want a library of experiences, you go to neuropraxis.com, and that is a library of curated neurosculpting meditations. If you want to learn the five step process with some instruction, you go to neurosculptinginstitute.com. And you go to our learning store, which we're about to upgrade in January. And there's tons of classes for download and schedule for events and things like that. Okay. So cool. I'm definitely going to be a part of that. I love that. Yes. I mean, on, and obviously all of this is in the show notes. So again, thank you so much, Lisa. You are amazing. I'm excited for more connection with you. And I just appreciate you so much. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much. All right. Okay.